Good morning, friends, and welcome to this, the Wednesday morning edition of the Grace Hour. We are broadcasting live here from our studios, located at the home of the Greater Grace World Outreach, right here in Baltimore, Maryland. Great to be with you, friends, on this Wednesday morning, and welcome to the Grace Hour. And this is our broadcast, our podcast that takes a dive into the daily challenges of the life of the believer and helps us to learn a little bit more about our faith in a practical way. And talk about practicality, we're talking about money this week on the Grace Hour. And money, that that impacts all of us. I'm certain of it. Um, I would even dare say um, that a day doesn't go by where we don't think about money. Um, can we afford this? Uh, do we have enough money to pay the bills? Uh, as we look into the future, which sometimes is not the wisest thing to do, are we financially prepared for that? I mean, there's so many issues, so many questions about this all-important subject, and I say that, that it's all-important because it's a part of our lives, and we do have to address it. But addressing it from a biblical perspective is so vital, so important. And that's why we're discussing it this week as our theme on the Grace Hour. We want to remind you, friends, you can join us during the broadcast. We'll keep the phone lines open throughout the entire broadcast. And anytime you'd like to weigh in, share a thought with us, ask a question, um, we hope you will. Here are the numbers, toll free. In all of North America, 800-338-7060. Again, it's 800-338-7060. And if you're joining us locally in the greater Baltimore area, we encourage you to give us a call at 410-483-3700. That, of course, is our local telephone number. The chat's open, and if you'd like to weigh in and share a thought on the chat here, then please feel free to do so. We want to thank you for joining us today in the podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on YouTube. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and many, many more. Uh, We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. We do want to remind everyone in our local uh, listening area, tonight's our midweek service here at the Greater Grace World Outreach, which begins promptly at 7 p.m., and everybody's welcome. We hope you'll come out and join us for a time of worship and fellowship and a message from the Word of God tonight right here at the Greater Grace World Outreach in Baltimore. We're located at 6025 Moravia Park Drive. Again, that's Baltimore, the zip code 21206. Hope you can make it out tonight. My name is Pastor John Love. Joining me in the studio, Pastor Steve Andrelonis, uh, Pastor Barry Quirk, usually with us on Wednesday mornings. Um, he's busy today. They have an open house here at the Greater Grace Christian Academy. He, being the principal of the school, is there welcoming potential new families and new students. And uh, Pastor Steve, welcome. Good to be here. What do you think about this theme, this subject? It's uh, huh. has a lot to say. Well, yeah, I think you're right. You uh, said it right at the beginning. Like it's every day we're thinking about it. You know, uh, used to, you know, look in our wallet and see what was there. <laughs> now, of course, we can, uh, you know, we can check s- our bank statements. <laughs> we can do that, or we can just uh, slap our card onto a little device and. Four lights light up and you're good. They send you along the way. And that wow. seems to indicate that there's something in my account, you know. Uh, but I, I think you're right. I mean, it is like if there's one thing that that uh, that could like really, uh, you know, what are we going to, what can we afford? How are we going to spend it today? Some people, uh, that's a really big issue. You know, they, they're like they, every dime has got to be accounted for, you know. Other people are not in that situation. I wouldn't classify myself in that situation than having to be uh, account for every dime. But I think it's wise uh, to know uh, what you're spending your money on and how much money you have. It just, um, you know, Jesus did talk a lot about money. I mean, we could see he paid attention to what was being given in the treasury there that day. And the, the widow with the two mites was honored by him. She had two pennies. Uh, you know, Jesus seemed to indicate that, that was, um, he did indicate that, that was all that she had. So, <laughs> you know, she was willing to give what she had uh, for the 
the work of the the temple at that point, you know. Yeah. Fascinating when you think about it. Um, I think it's important to note, and I'm not even certain if it was previously stated in our earlier broadcasts this week, um, and I think when you talk about money, you can't mm-hmm. help but think about this verse that Paul wrote to Timothy and said in verse 10 of the sixth chapter, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Oftentimes you hear this verse misquoted. Yeah, People say money is the root of all evil, and they, they forget the first part of that, which is the most important part of that passage, yeah. which says the love of money yeah. is at the root of of all that is evil. So when you're talking about money as believers, it's not a bad thing to talk about. It's not a bad subject to bring up. It's it's a good theme to be discussing this week on our podcasts, but it's the love of money. That's where you can really get off track. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, Jesus did say it. He had a person come to him who was doing all the commandments. You know, he's called the rich young ruler. And I like the account in Mark, you know, which is a little bit different because it drops in that statement, Jesus loving him, loved him and told him the truth about what he needed to do and just about the the possessions that he had and the control that they had over his life. You know, he was living according to the commandments. I've kept all of these commandments. And Jesus said, well, there's one thing you lack because I don't have all of your heart. That's the way that I sort of, maybe you read that the same way. When Jesus, you know, Jesus loved him enough to put the finger on the thing. Well, if you know, I need all of your heart in order for you to be a part of what I'm doing Mm -hmm. and a part of the real, the real kingdom of God, the true kingdom of God. Now what you're doing and you know, that your possessions have possessed you basically. And you're right. The love, I mean, it wasn't that he had money, it was the love of money, and I we miss some of those little statements throughout the Bible where it says that different women supported Jesus with their substance, and then we know that Priscilla and Aquila they were tent makers along with Paul. They were, you know, they were reasonable entrepreneurs, business people. Uh, you know, at least at first, I don't know, you know, how long they kept that up. We know that Lydia was a seller of purple when he found her. Uh, you know, and met her on the shore. I think that's Philippi, right? Is that Philippi where Lydia is? I could be wrong. I could be corrected on that. But we know that, you know, these people had their means and it was, you know, but they also had this connection with Jesus. So, um, you know, using your money and uh, living, you know, having money for your basic necessities and having money even above basic necessities. It's not like, uh, it's not something that Jesus, like you said, the love of money is the root of the evil. Yeah. That's what that's it, what Jesus is saying to avoid there. It, it seems that money really clearly is, is secondary in God's eyes. Yeah. It, it's not, you know, <laughs> although we may think about it on a daily basis, he's not thinking about it on a daily basis. And I love, uh, read a statement many, many years ago where um, um, an author, a Christian author, wrote and said, you know, if your faith doesn't impact your money and your marriage, he says, mm. it's probably not worth having. Mm. It's a good statement, uh, because we want, as you said, Christ to impact our entire being, the whole man, which obviously very clearly touches our finances, yeah. as well as all of our relationships as well. But um, God's bigger than money, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, and he doesn't God. really yeah, need thank, money. We're, we're thankful for that. Yeah. I know, he doesn't really need money to fulfill his purposes, and yet he addresses that theme and subject in our lives because I think he wants to see if we will exercise faith in him, trust in him, especially and even with our finances. Well, you know, they did have a, the apostles did have a bag. They put the wrong guy in charge of it, apparently. Judas, you know, and he had a, a love for money, apparently, and there was a root there, and uh, he had such a love for money that he took uh, pieces of silver to surrender Jesus to the authorities there. So, yeah, um, you know, I, I, you can't escape it, really. You can't escape the nature of, of money. It, You know, it's... Um, it's just a part, it's woven into the fabric of the world system. And uh, if when he removes us, you know, when, when, when things are recreated, then this won't be such an issue, but it's going to be something that we have to 
face as believers and and seeking first the kingdom of God. There's a lot of instruction in, in you know what will be added to us and uh, the poor you will have with you always. And um, you know that said, you know the the what is it? it's the um, the Psalm is it Psalm 91? I've never seen the the children of the righteous begging for bread. So we see the promises of God's provision. And can we hold on to those? Uh, but I mean, you know, I could, you know, a little bit of money, you get a little bit of money and, and it can really excite you sometimes. It can excite you sometimes and really throw you, throw you off of your, um, what is it, right? Uh, you know, it can make you crazy, I guess, if you let it get to you, right? Yeah, absolutely. I remember reading a story about a brother who uh, looked out the window of his second story apartment and he saw people. And then he turned in that same room and looked in a mirror and only saw himself. And what made the difference between the window and the mirror is just a little silver. You add silver to the glass and the, the glass yeah, becomes wow. a mirror. That's so right. in other words, when money gets a hold of us, when money maybe gets rooted in our hearts, and the tendency to stop seeing people and only to see yourself is very real. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that, that's yeah, that, that's that's true. Yeah, to yeah, and I think that's why um, you know the nature of giving, tithing, offerings, these kinds of things. We look in the Bible and we. You know, we tend to see them as, you know, commandments or rules of living or rules for a holy, righteous life. But the truth is that um, uh, we found, I think the two of us could say this, we found that giving or tithing or operating this way is, a, is really a, um, a source of rest in God. It's, you know, it, it's a way of uh, releasing money's control on us. Like, and God put those things in there. Give us, gives us instruction. Here's a baseline. You know, ten percent a tithe is ten percent. Well, why would He say that? Well, it's just, you know, everyone looks for, everyone, you know, the human nature being what it is, we're all looking for the minimum, the minimum. Like, what's the bare minimum we can do? And then God sort of says, okay, it's all mine. Everything you have is mine. I am all in all. Your capacity to work, the health that you have to go to work, uh, the fact that you work for a boss who actually uh, manages his finances enough to make sure you he gives you what he owes you in terms of the contract. That all of that is a part of, you know, the design of God and the purpose of God. But, um, you know, if you can give, if you can, you know, take this ten percent and give it to the work of God, uh, then. Um, you know, it's saying something. There's a release to it. Uh, Malachi, you know, we know that from the tithing that there's a, if you don't give it, there's like a devour on your finances. You'll find yourself like I, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, I drove, you know, I came out to get in my car and I look at the front driver's side wheel and it's totally flat. So, you know, got to call the, the, you know, the service and they came and uh, took it off and there's this screw in it. Like, so took it over to my mechanic. Oh, it's, it's great. It's, you know, you know, we put these tires on the car. We're going to fix this for nothing. All right. Awesome. That's great. Four days later, I had another screw in another tire, but this time it went through the sidewall, which meant that it could not be plugged or repaired. So that was like $200 for a brand new tire and balancing and all that kind of thing. And he said, we're sorry. You know, I said, I understand it's like, but I didn't put the screws in the road. You know, they're doing like some maintenance on the uh, gas things, the gas lines through my neighborhood. So I think that's why there's screws everywhere. But I give the thing I thought about was like, okay, um, you know, am I right? I did think about it really. Am I right with God? Cause here's like, here's like this little, okay. I had this one thing. Okay. And then I had another thing is like, am, is there a devour on my finances? Is it, is there something about money that I'm, am I not, you know, I mean, I just did a little bit of self-examination, you know, and you know, you just think like, cause it's just like the, when the, when things happen, money can just get sucked away from you. And that's why <laughs> yeah. you, you shouldn't hold on to it. You know, yeah. you know, I, I get it. Proverbs tells us a lot about wealth and, 
trying to haste to be wealth and the you know the 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 wealth gets wings and then i think even ecclesiastes it says the wealthy man is the wealthy man who has a love for money uh inordinate love for money is the one who doesn't sleep yeah wow that's so true. Hey, phone lines are open, friends, and if you'd like to weigh in, join us that way with a phone call. We welcome you. 800-338-7060 is the toll-free number uh, throughout all of North America. Locally, uh, in the Baltimore area, you can give us a call at 410-483-3700. You know, w- when I think of what God has entrusted us with, and, you know, we, we're not speaking from the perspective of being wealthy people, but but at the same time, God has entrusted us. He has given us stewardship over what um, He has given us. I often think of this verse, and uh, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 4, 7, where he says, who, who makes you to differ from another? And what do you have that you have not received? Now, if you did receive it, then how can you glory as if you hadn't received it? Um, I love that verse because it's a, it's a constant reminder to me that everything that we have, including our money, has come to us from God. Our money is on loan to us from mm-hmm. God. And are we good stewards of that which God has entrusted to us? I think that's always a, a good question to ask ourselves because we want to mm-hmm. we want to be faithful in that particular area of our lives in much the same way that we would be faithful to church services, mm-hmm. attending Bible studies, church services, um, prayer meetings, and, and so much more. Because money, it factors in there to the to the faithfulness that God is looking for in our lives, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, you know, we have time. You know, God's given us time. We're supposed to redeem it, and we get money, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, how we do apply that in the way that we live is, is important. You know, um, it's just, you know, it's one of those character tests really like, uh, you know, if you have something, I, I think of, um, what is it? Uh, you know, the word miser is the first part of miserable, you know, and we know the famous miser, the most famous miser is Dickens, Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge. We think about how tightly tight fisted he was and, uh, you know, he's visited by these um, ghosts of Christmas past and Christmas present and Christmas future, those kind of things. And um, a couple years ago, there was a movie that came out. Uh, you know, Dickens wrote this book at a point. It's kind of interesting. Dickens wrote this book at a point where he was overextended. It's like he had borrowed a certain amount of money to produce a book that hadn't sold very well. I think it was a series of essays on life in America, which is kind of interesting. Hey, you know, I mean, this is, we're talking the late 1800s, I guess. And, uh, you know, uh, the British are probably still, probably still stinging from the defeat of the 17, late 1700s, you know, Battle of Dundalk, not far from here. (laughs) It was a significant battle in the independence, you know, (laughs) but um, when you think about, uh, you know, you know, you know, I think that the, the the movie plays out where it's showing the wrestling of the of the author with this fact of money, how money was affecting him, and like really, I, he he was the character that grew out of this wrestling with the fact that he was had a problem with his finances was this Ebenezer Scrooge character, and it seems like you know what is my future? That was the big thing is like, uh, you know, all these characters are coming to life and sort of like, as they're speaking to the author and Ebenezer Scrooge asks the author, you know, Dickens, as you're writing the end of this book, is there any hope for me to be saved? Can I be saved? And, and the, the secret was to become generous, you know, and this really, I think this happened like once he released this book and it was produced, it became like a huge seller and he became like, uh, you know, because his, uh, his parents and he had spent time in debtor's prison, it's funny that in those days, like if you were indebted, overextended, and you couldn't uh, meet your obligation, imagine if you, Citibank or whatever, you know, could lock you up for not paying your credit card bill. That doesn't happen anymore. But back then it did. You got, you know, and you could be put into me- manual labor doing things to work off your debt, you know. 
and uh so but i think that's the thing like the the holding on to money the love of money if it becomes a consuming fire inside of a person you become miserable you become really it affects the rest of your life you're trying to hold on to something my you're miserly and uh, you're miserable and that brings us back to that earlier passage that we discussed in first timothy 6 where we're reminded we came into this world with nothing yes and we are going to leave with nothing Mm. so you know we're not going to uh, stuff our pockets mm-hmm. filled with money. <laughs> yeah. It, it, and you think back to what was it? The um, one of the stories about the sinking of the Titanic was, you know, w- did I, would I take an orange with me into a lifeboat or bars of gold? Wow. Um, you know, what's more valuable at that time when your life hangs in the balance? It's an orange, it's something to eat that will preserve you and keep you alive. The gold bars won't help you, if anything, really? that you might sink quickly, more quickly. Wow. So, I mean, you know, these kinds of things. And I love what Jesus said, in, and he was quoting from Hosea, the sixth chapter, I believe the sixth verse, in, in Matthew chapter 9, he said, but go and learn what this means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Sometimes, and, and of course, you hear this a lot from the unbelieving world. You know, you Christians are always harping about money. You're always needing money. You're always asking for money, uh, which, of course is not really the case, but that's their impression. But they have this idea behind that question that they ask us is, do you have to give money in order to be saved? Is -hmm. that why you do it? Is that why you make that Mm -hmm. sacrifice because you want to be assured that someday you'll go into the presence of God because you've given enough? But that whole idea implies that you can purchase your salvation. And of course, that is totally contradicting to what the scriptures teach. Well, it's religion as a business model, right? Exactly. Religion as a business model. And we know this became a very significant thing in uh, in the uh, 1400s, late 1400s and into the 1500s. It's the tipping point, really. The for indulgences, the, right? Yeah, for the Reformation. You know, I mean, there is a uh, there was a man, uh, you know, who was tasked with the uh, what do they call that? Um, the uh, I like to call it the imperial church. You know, it was a church that was operating as like a, a government entity, and they were you know selling these these documents that the head of the church was releasing you from you know from your you know your sin. You know, you can. This is a way to repent. You know, that's what they were saying. Every you know, every time a coin in the coffer rings, another soul from purgatory springs. Mm. So I'm sorry, I probably just told you what religious orientation I'm talking, what was going on there. But this was the thing that really, like, you know, paying for, you know, paying your way or paying somebody else's way out of their eternal destiny was like, you know, a business model. And it became... And, um, you know, and, you know, pay ahead, pay ahead, you know, it's like pay so you can play, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I forget where I, uh, where I read it, but there is like, um, uh, I haven't watched this movie in forever. You know, it's come, it's a a movie that comes from my youth from the seventies, the Godfather, but there is like a, a scene there where the, the mafia leaders are, putting money into the offering and it's like they're putting money into the offering while the hitmen are going out to you know probably collect their loan shark debts or something like that but you know they're they're supporting this church with their offering but at the same time they're making sure that they get back the money they had you know and it, it's like kind of interesting you you pay to play it's a religion as a business model you know if i put in enough then you know it's going to balance an account of what i do wrong it's like and this is you know we know that that this is not the model of jesus <laughs> this yeah. is not the, the it's not grace and mercy at all it's like it's just uh you know like and that's why jesus said to the spoke to the point of the woman who gave what she had her heart was to give everything throw everything, cast everything into the the treasury. And Jesus said others just, you know, they just brought, you know, they just brought, you know, whatever was left over after they had already Mm. uh, bought their new chariot or whatever (laughs) (laughs) back then. Uh, Friends, you can join us. I do want to extend that invitation to you again. The phone lines are open, and and some of you may 
have a question about finances, money in particular, and how believers are responsible with their money uh, in the sight of God and what they should be doing with their money. Um, you know, a, a lot of people on this theme and subject, they really don't know what to do with mm -hmm. their money. Uh, if mm -hmm. Especially, let's say, for instance, you're a new believer, yeah. and you find yourself um, instantly, overnight, wealthy. I remember many, many years ago, one of the uh, NBA players came to me, and he basically said, you know, hey, I'm making a lot of money, more than I could ever imagine. Um, and he asked this question, he says, what should I do with it? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I wasn't going to answer him you know, very quickly, I just wanted to say, well, you know, let me talk to somebody who maybe they can help you and, and, and figure out the best way for you to manage your money. But he was saying it from the perspective as a believer, because he was a believer, and he was like, I want to know what God wants me to do with this wealth. And, you know, a lot of people ask that question. And, and what are some of the guidelines, per, potentially, that we could share with them as to how to best use their wealth to glorify God and further his kingdom. Well, I think the Holy Spirit is a good place to start. Like, Holy Spirit, I have this. I don't want this to just uh, fritter away. Uh, it's, you know, people could come, people uh, who are only looking for, um, you know, the wrong measure of support. They don't really want to work. Some people, you know, like you've heard these stories, you can read the stories of people win the lottery, all of a sudden, long lost relatives are there. And it's, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, like when you think of an athlete and, you know, um, these contracts are, are, are remarkably, um, geez, it's just, it's hard to imagine. Like, you know, there's a, there's a baseball player who's like now negotiating, like, uh, a deal that will pay him till age 41 and he'll get $350 million or something like that. I'm like, just thinking, I just trying to wrap my head around that. You know, I, I think if I added up everything that I made from the time I started working at age 13, <laughs> serving newspapers and then working for Burger King for five and a half years. And then, you know, uh, you know, I think I could probably say that maybe if you put all of my salaries together over the years, I, I'm sure I've made, you know, you know, add it all together over 50 years of working, uh, then maybe I've made a million dollars or maybe a couple million, you know, but I didn't make it all at once. I can't imagine like you step onto the basketball court for 48 minutes of action and probably, and just, let's remember, you do get subbed out every now and then. So maybe you, if you're a real good player, you play 40 minutes and you made a million dollars that night, you know, so you can divide it there. You made, you know, for, you know, for every 10 minutes you played, you made a quarter million dollars. It's like, it's just, when we think it is mind boggling. And how do you spend that? You know, those of us who like think about, you know, going to the, the grocery store and the, you know, putting that and now we like, you know, we just now eggs have dropped back down below the 250 level. I noticed at the store the other day, but a couple of weeks ago we were paying $5 for a dozen of eggs and everyone was like going, that's like, how did this happen? Like, what do we do with it? You know? And, but a person stepping on a basketball court, you know, there's a, I guess, um, like the guidance, the Holy spirit giving you the measure of stewardship. Uh, I'm like, you know, uh, have God show you, uh, you know, how to, uh, you know, from the Bible, how to divide that. I think, uh, again, Ecclesiastes, to seven things, to eight, you know, you know, don't have your money all wrapped up in. It's talking about, you know, investments are, are something that's, you know, that's tricky. I mean, I have a couple of pension plans that I, I don't really control, but they produce, they're producing, a, you know, some something that I can use later on when I decide, choose to retire, that kind of thing. Um, I think the wisdom of God uh, and good, um, having good uh, people that you can talk to about it is the, is the way I think it's like, I, it seems like there isn't like a real, if we go through the Bible, we don't see like a whole lot of uh, like, like we don't see a checklist. Okay. Give, you know, you, you got your tithe, you give that. That's the one thing God is saying, support the place where you're getting spiritually 
uh, fed. And if you are a part of that, you should tithe. You should do that. It's yeah. just like, a, it's a great way of just, uh, you know, trusting God. He said to do it, so do it, you know? And um, that's that's really the only answer we could give to that. Like with the basketball player, I have all this money, you know, yeah. tithe, you know, you, what, what church are you? And that's the first that you start from there. And then like whenever you, you get anything, I think you just really need to be very prayerful about it. You Absolutely. Know? And, and, you know, the poor you'll have with you always. There's going to be people, you know, who need you know, who needs support. And it might be better not to just hand them a wad of cash. It might be better to like go and buy them a car, you know, and say, you need a car to get back and forth to work. If I give you the cash, you'll probably spend it on something. But if I give you the car to get to work, you can't sell that car, you know, or, or whatever, or, or buy a house or something like that. You know, it just, mm. uh, we're not in that position. I don't think you're in that position. I know that I'm not <laughs> in that position to buy a house for somebody, but it well, is interesting. It is. Uh, it, you know, I, I love the fact that um, the Bible says that there are people's uh, faith that we can follow. And I, and I've always been encouraged and challenged to look at the lives of, of men and women who follow God so wholeheartedly that, you know, instead of having finances and money as their list, at the top of the list of their priorities, it's God, mm -hmm. it's others, it's yeah. people. And I, I find that so encouraging because uh, there's, you know, I, I'm going to use him as an example, Pastor Schaller. Um, you know, I, I understand based upon conversations with him and the way he operates, the way he walks by faith before God. He's not, he's not occupied with money. He's not thinking about money. No. He's, it, it, this is not a priority to him. He just wants to take the time and the opportunities that God has given him and use them to glorify God and minister to the lives of people. It's, it, his life is more about compassion and mercy and encouragement of others and and it, it's almost like the, the money's just it's not even on the table he's not even thinking that way and when you find someone that has that kind of a a quality of faith that's authentic genuine and you they don't just say it they live that way you can you it, that's a faith that you should follow yeah and you know we we don't want to dismiss that i mean there are people who are really struggling and we have to recognize that and uh, the want of money is not a sin the love of money is the root of all evil but the want or the the need for money is something that you know is very real to a lot of people especially maybe older people as they they lose their their jobs at certain point you know you can be at a certain point that you're you're in your mid 60s and suddenly you know someone says we we don't really need you anymore and they cut you off and that you know and that there can you know that can create like a real stress like what do we do with that where do we how do you know we, you know what are you going to do about this lord and uh, how to help people like that is uh you know a church is good for that a church is good to have a place where you can talk about those kind of things get prayer for that uh, you know, but, uh, you know, I mean, the Holy Spirit will lead you in how to, if, how to spend your money. Now, I, you know, I, I, uh, my sins come back to me at this point. <laughs> there was a certain, you know, I would say that some people are better at this than others. I was not good at it. There was a series of years where I managed the money and the finances and I put us into a huge hole. And then my wife looked at things and I could still hear her as I was like, uh, upstairs far away from the the debit sheet that she was looking at and i heard what did you do and i <laughs> i you know i would say there was this uh, there was this woman i don't know if she's still around but she put out a book uh, she was a part of a uh she had a thing called cheapskate monthly and she put out a there was a book on how to um and it gave like a way to dig yourself out mm. like you know going with the smallest bill first you know just get, build a momentum of getting rid of that bill mm. and then add what you were paying on that bill to the next bill and then you're paying you're not paying this bill and it worked and my uh my wife who was be much better with numbers than i was and mm. who said now i'm now it's like i'm very like after that experience i'm very like you know i'm like i'm very 
careful about how I spend. I, I, I think about money before I spend it. And, uh, you know, I, I generally ask uh, questions. What, what account should I give, you know? Yeah. That's, so that's wisdom. Yeah, we have a call. We got a call. Okay. Lauren is joining us from uh, New York State. Lauren, uh, thanks for holding on and go right ahead. Go Good ahead, morning. Lauren. Can you hear us? Uh, yeah, you will fine. Can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Okay, uh, I was uh, thinking about that that uh, that scripture at the end of Proverbs where the man says, "Don't don't give me too much." Where I where I say, "Who was the Who was the Lord?" Um, and then treat him as though he doesn't exist or or don't give me too little where i have to steal you know yes i i love that that that's balance isn't it if you if you yeah well also why i have you here keep in mind on the 30th of march uh baltimore opens up against boston up in fenway that's right i i heard that so we'll, we'll be watching that carefully <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, I know and you will. Lauren, I know that if, because you're a baseball fan, you know that the Orioles, um, well, they put together a wonderful season last year, and I think that they're on track to do it once again. So um, they've struggled in years past, but it looks like they're moving in the right direction now. Yep. Well, okay, thanks, well, Lauren. Appreciate that. That's a great portion of Scripture, and maybe we could just uh, highlight that for a moment, Pastor Steve. Yeah. Um, that that is a great balanced approach, isn't it? Lord, meet my needs. Yeah. Um, so that I don't, you know, uh, I don't enter into poverty and have to beg. Yet, don't give me so much that I forget you. And yeah. That's a that's such a beautiful, uh, you know, balance and perspective from from the scripture. Yeah, I think, you know, I, you know, like uh if if you're you know the the walk of faith uh sometimes means that uh you know there might be a point in life where we don't have anything. And like and that is like you said don't give me too much and don't give me too little. Just keep me balanced, keep me aware. Um, you know, being a good steward is like it's like the money is not ours if you see it that way. I think that's maybe the best advice we could give, if you see your money as something that that's not going to be there all the time, it's not a permanent thing, it's going to go, uh, and you let the Holy Spirit help you steward that money, that is like spend it wisely. And, um, you know, I would say, uh, you know, uh, you know what, how, do, how can we do that? Be very careful with credit cards. That's my, uh, that was my thing. I use credit cards to sort of like... Uh, you know, to drive up the debt and, you, you know, you're buying things you don't really need with money you don't have. That's the way somebody put it. It's like, if you had the money in the bank and you could take it out, you would be careful and you would analyze that. But if you just have a credit card, you just say, ah, you know, let's say, uh, you know, the whole restaurant is on me, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> the, the, you know, that kind of thing. Um, uh, but I think like, uh, you know, being careful, thinking about what I really, what's really necessary and, um, you know, after you get on your, after you get your necessities, then if you have a little bit of leftover, then that's, that's the moment of truth really. Right. Yeah. Cause I got money that's not doing anything. And do I give it to a, you know, to a missionary? Do I give it mm -hmm. to like, to send a kid to camp life? That always mm -hmm. happens. Yes, it does. You know, there's an inner city kid that can't go. Mm -hmm. His parents can't do, it, but you could pay for their go, you know, going there and, uh, and your church, you know, like, uh, you know, there's plenty of people around and some people are very quiet about it. They just send money and they don't want to know about it. That's another thing. Like yeah. you don't want to be Ananias and Sapphira, you know, coming and laying down money for the affirmation it's going to give you. You wanna, you want to give it like, uh, you know, quietly. You don't want to lie to the Holy Spirit. You know, hey, look at that! Wow, he's a star. I'm going to be a star if I give this kind of money. But I don't want to give it all. <laughs> you know, that's you know, that's that. There's there's the big heart issue right yeah, there. Absolutely. And of course, Jesus went so far as to say that when you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Uh, so, th which, which is really incredible, because I think some people, unfortunately, they may give because they need mm -hmm. the notoriety and they need to be acknowledged for what they've done. Uh, you, you brought up the 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 incident recorded in the Book of Acts, the fifth chapter, Ananias and Sapphira. I mean, that you know, people would say, "Wow, that was pretty serious." I mean, they, they just because they kept back some of the a portion of their what they sold their property for. Uh, maybe for a rainy day, you know, mm -hmm. it seems pretty, pretty harsh the way they were dealt with. But yet, remember something, that was the beginning 
of the church age. Yeah. And God was sending a message. And the message, I think, was really simple. I want you to trust me yeah. and what I can provide for you, not mammon or money and what that can provide for you. And, and I mean, something similar to that happened in the Old Testament when the children of Israel were moving into the promised land. Yeah. Right at the mm-hmm. uh, the great battle of Jericho, yeah, they were told not to take the the golden wedge and and the Babylonian garment, but yeah. yet you know, one man did and said, yeah. "I'll I'll hide it in my tent. If things don't work out well here with God bringing us into the land, I'll have what I need for a rainy day." Mm-hmm. But the consequences were severe. Once again, in that case, it was the beginning of God bringing His people into the promised land. In Ananias and Sapphira's case, it was God starting this new church age. And in both instances, God was saying, look, you have a choice. You can either trust me or you can trust your stuff and your money. Hmm. You have to make that choice. And I think that's what's so good about addressing this theme and subject this week in the Grace Hour, because Jesus said, it came down to this, you can't serve two masters. That's right. You got to make up your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I think, you know, when you're you're talking about those two incidents and everyone could say like, wow, what a harsh response. And, uh, uh, you know, in the case of Ananias and Sapphira, I think we have to look beyond the, the you know, the, the matter of the heart, as one uh, texter is saying, it's a matter of the heart. Uh, there's a pride of life there. Uh, you know, just before, you got to read before, in the previous chapter, Barnabas is, uh, you know, is celebrated for selling his property and giving the money. So they say, well, we could be celebrated too. And there's the heart issue. Like you want to be celebrated as Barnabas was celebrated. So you're going to sell property. But when you get the, when you, maybe the, maybe you got a windfall there. Whoa, I didn't realize the property was going to be worth so much. And, you know, so you should have just been honest. Okay. We sold a piece of property and we're given 40% to the movement. And that would have been fine. It's like, but instead when you come lay it down and you're thinking like, we're going to get the Barnabas treatment and, you know, and uh, I think he had another name. He got a new name, you know, after that, I think he had a different name and then he got a new name, which meant son of consolation. I was like, well, what kind of names are we going to get? Like, you know, (laughs) what are they going to call us if we give this? So that's a big, you know, thing. And, um, yeah, uh, you know, that's, you know, the matters of the heart there. It's like, it's, 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 I mean, I, I, maybe we're not giving like, uh, you know, that we're, we're, we're struggling to give like hard and fast answers because there aren't hard and fast answers right. in the Bible, you that's know, right. and that's why we're, we, we just can't give them like you, you might be a very wealthy person, very, very spiritual person. You may be helping lots of people. And at the same time, there's, you know, people who are more in the category of mother Teresa, they have two, two, uh, garments and they, help people and you know but both you know whatever you're doing in the will of god and the purpose of god will be celebrated in heaven for the heart behind it yeah uh, as you said uh, you know that's behind everything is our heart attitude and without that um, all of our giving you know and and you just hope that people don't give because hey they're going to put my name on a plaque and put it in the church hallway so that everybody can see it and i can be acknowledged and applauded um that's not the right motive. And I think yeah. motive is everything. It right? is. It is. Well, I'm laughing because there was, you know, parking spaces. We're just going to leave those two <laughs> words out there. Uh, but yeah. parking spaces, it's, you know, it's, it's something that those who know about it, that's fine. Don't ask us to elaborate, but it is like, yeah. you know, uh, you know, it's just, it, it can be, you know, that's a, that was a evidence. I think like, you know, people were like, you know, well, this is going to like set sort of a hierarchy because if you gave enough, then you got this. And it's like, hmm, interesting. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> uh, there, there's a brother in, in our own ministry that, you know, he gives um, and sacrificially to, you know, help young people um, with whatever, you know, might be camp life. It might be a trip that they take overseas, and he, he really gives very freely and willingly. And every time I thank him, he always has the same response: "Don't thank me. Thank God." Mm. Uh, that's somebody who is acknowledging the fact that his ability to be able to give and to help others is really the work of God in his life, yeah. and he wants God to be glorified. Because I always want to say, look, you know, we, we, we should be giving you an award. We should be giving you a plaque. We should be acknowledging you. Yeah. Um, he always responds the same way. No, let's just mm. glorify God. Let's acknowledge 
his grace in our lives. And that, that means everything. Yep. Well, um, we've reached the end of today's broadcast. Pastor Steve, thanks so much for coming in today. Um, this is a this is a great subject. And I don't know if we're that, experts about it, but no, we, I, uh, I don't think we are. But we use money. Yes, absolutely. So we have some experience. <laughs> That's right. All being limited, though it is. But thank yeah. you so much for joining us today. And for those of you that joined the chat, God bless you, Vladimir. Great to hear from you, David, Elizabeth, Marion, and uh, Madeline. Thank you so much. And thank you, Lauren, for giving us a call. Friends, we appreciate you tuning in. We hope that you will tell someone about our podcast here in the Grace Hour and tell them that they can tune in, watch it on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, podcast rather, and Spotify and more. And we appreciate you taking the time to be with us. We'll be back tomorrow to continue to take a look at this all-important subject. Yeah, and come to then, church, yeah, right? Oh, that's right. 7 o'clock tonight, church service right here at the Greater Grace World Outreach in Baltimore. We hope you can make it. God bless you until tomorrow at the same time.